This day, when it had light, Mother called me a wretch. Wretch, she said. I saw in her eyes the anger. I wonder what it is. A wretch. Here we go. Here we Back go. At it again. Uh huh. With another episode. Five seconds after our last one. Totally math, as they say in that one cartoon. What was that cartoon called? Uh, but totally math. Uh, mathematic. What? What is the Adventure Time with Finn and Jake? That's right. He would be like mathematical or whatever. That was the oh, thing. Yeah. I bring it up because this week we're talking about math. The math man. The math. We already went over all this in the last episode. <laughs> yeah, we did, and we can't do it as excitedly again because we just did. Because we just episode. did it. We're doing these back to back. The math man is back. Richard Burton Matheson, uh, born 1926, died 2013 at the age of 87. Uh, the father of Richard Matheson. <laughs> The other Richard Matheson, uh, author of such books as I Am Legend, The Shrinking Man, A Stir of Echoes, Hell House, What Dreams May Come, and Bid Time Return, The Basis for Somewhere in Time. Uh, if you haven't seen one of his movies, then you probably haven't seen movies. Uh, oh, also he wrote Steel, which was the basis for Real Steel, the boxing robot movie, and Button Button, which was the basis for many adaptations called The Box. Uh, and... Uh, the movie Cold Sweat, apparently, is based on his novel Ride the Nightmare, and his novel Someone is Bleeding was the basis for the movie <laughs> Icy Breasts. So, whether you're, whether you're looking for Legends, Shrinking Men, or Icy, Icy Breasts, um, Richard, Richard the Math Man, Dickie Math, is your man. Also, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. It's also him. I'm really glad that no one named Richard Matheson will ever listen to any of our episodes. <laughs> oh, also, uh, he wrote the screenplay to a very, very famous movie. Uh, yeah? Called The Raven. <laughs> You're lying. He wrote the screenplay to a very famous movie called The Raven, not the Raven we watched, though. Okay. Uh, I was like, that's the, he was. That's too far up in the past. Not the Raven we watched, uh, but another Raven that also has Boris Karloff in it. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's why they're easily confused. There's two Boris Karloff movies called The Raven, but one was written by Dickie Math. Uh, one was written by uh, apparently an insane person because <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's horrible and weird and. Uh, uh yeah, this guy wrote so much. He wrote God, he wrote Oh. He wrote the screenplay to Burn Witch Burn oh. based on Night of the Eagle. That's why we've discussed him there we in go. the past. He, uh he said something about Duel too. Yep, yeah, he wrote Duel. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have discussed him several times. Uh for I mean with a name like Richard Matheson, how can you not? How can you not? You've got to bring him up whenever you can. Oh, yeah. and we've also, oh, we also talked about him because when we talked about, I think, The Haunting of Hill House, mm -hmm. um, The Haunting, we talked about Hell House and how yeah, they're not the same thing, but he wrote that, like he wrote Hell yeah, House. Like you kept accidentally saying Hell House instead of Hill House. Yeah. Um, and I think we've probably talked about some TV episodes, like I've talked about mm -hmm. some adaptations he's done. Um, he's just, the guy just never stopped writing. And so many. That's what of, you gotta do. So many of his things were made into into movies, like yeah. because he's a he's like a Twilight Zone writer. He wrote so many episodes of the Twilight Zone. Like he also wrote episodes of the New Twilight Zone and parts of the Twilight Zone movie. Like he's just, uh, yeah, very famous. Look, guy. if you're gonna be a writer, you gotta go all in. <laughs> right. He also has so many collections of story. Like it's just you can't get away from the man. You can't get away from the man. Why would you try? You can't get away from him. You can't he get away. Try because he's he comes. a great writer. He's running at you. He's running. You better duck. Here comes Dick Math. Uh, Dick Math. What was I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Damn Willow <laughs> moment right there. Um, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, born of man and woman. Born of man and woman. Nineteen fifties. 
Born of Man and Woman. Uh, not only 1950s Born of Man and Woman, I believe this is his first published short story. Uh, yep. It's a short one. His first professional sale, written when he was 22 years old in the July issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Oh, God. Um, I only have so many months to catch up. <laughs> it's also the title of his first short story collection, uh, Born of Man and Woman. Uh, and you a good can, title for a short story collection. You can kind of see how this is his, like, hit the ground running story. Uh, mm mm-hmm. It's very similar in a lot of ways to H.P. Lovecraft's The Outsider, which is a, if you're not if you're not familiar, H.P. Lovecraft's The Outsider is a very short story by H.P. Lovecraft, told in first person from the perspective of a monster that is chained up in a in a in a castle, uh, mm-hmm. who because he is a terrifying monster, but is also related to the people who live in the castle. It became the sort yeah. of basis for the movie Castle Freak. Um, but it's told from its perspective and you get this sort of like really sympathetic, it's the outsider. So you get this sympathetic concept of a monster, what it's like Mm -hmm. to be the monster in a, in a monster story. Uh, Richard Matheson turns around as his thesis is like, I'm going to write basically that same story. It's going to be shorter and, uh, you're going to be, it's going to be a child. It's going to be a child. You're going to feel even more sympathetic for this thing. (laughs) Yep. I wouldn't even call it a thing. I would call it a child. It's a child. It's a terrifying child that drips green goo and sticks to the stairs, but it's a child all the same. It can read. It can write. I think I didn't even pick up that it was like inhuman. Oh, it's inhuman. It bleeds green. It's. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's well, I mean, it's human because it's their child. Because they had a baby and it's this, um, but we'll get it. I thought that I was going to say we'll get into it, but nothing like it's so short. Like this is. Yeah. It's told We're like a, into it. Yeah, it's told like a diary. Um, mm-hmm. You don't know if it's a boy or a girl. It's chained up in the cellar uh, of of the house, and it's treated like a like a like a. It's like a what's the, Batman Returns? The Penguin is born, and the parents lock mm-hmm. it in a cage and then throw him over the bridge. It's basically that, except they don't kill this child. Uh, they just keep this child chained up in a dirty a dirty basement. Yeah, see, I, when I was reading this, I thought the green was like the kid vomiting from mm. the pain. Yeah, I think it's actually, I think it's actually that it, it this stuff comes out of its pores. Yeah. Um. Um. But again, this is told from the perspective of the child who is clearly not hyper educated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it says, I spilled some of the drip on the floor from one arm. It was not nice. It mm. made ugly green right, on the yeah. floor. As unpleasant as that is to read. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's an icky story. Yeah, it says, I will I will hang down by all my legs, all my legs, <laughs> and laugh and a drip green all over until they are sorry they didn't be nice to me. So it has multiple legs and it drips green when it wants to. <laughs> Again, I thought it might, I guess it refers to the, ar- I guess it refers to the arms as arms. So it wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was a like a child who was born with a like disability or something that they locked in the basement because they didn't want to see it. I mean, that's, that's the, the way it's framed. Yeah. Like this could just be a child who gets locked in the basement because they don't mm-hmm. want to see it. Um, but it's also a child with many legs who drips green. <laughs> Listen, if you give birth to a, a monster baby, you gotta love the monster baby. Have you learned nothing from Frankenstein? Yeah, I mean, there is that. There is the uh there is the uh the idea of this is something we've created mm-hmm. and because we are shunning it, we are being punished for it. Now, it reminds me a bit. Do you remember the story It's a Good Life by Jerome Bixby? I read it out loud to you. It's about the little boy with psychic powers who sends people to yeah. the cornfield. Mm-hmm. Um, there was also a Twilight Zone episode based on it. So, ta-da, ta-da. Maybe written by Richard Matheson. I'm, no, it was written by Rod Serling. Um, yeah. But in that story, you hear about the little boy Anthony a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's not until you get to late in the story that you realize that Anthony doesn't even look like a person. That Anthony mm-hmm. is like in the TV version and in the movie version, he's just a cute little boy. 
But in the short story, he is clearly something that is horrifying to behold. Yeah. Um, and and th- that this story kind of does that too. Mm-hmm. It may as well, except for a few hints, be just a normal child until you get near the end. And it's like... And you're like, oh, this is not a normal child. Right. I'll creep across the ceiling on my many legs. <laughs> like, <laughs> See, see th- the... You feel really bad for this kid the entire time. Uh Uh-huh. And that killed a cat. (laughs) Well, so it's confined to this basement. It's chained to the wall. I'll say, I'll stop saying it. They're confined to a basement. They're chained to a wall. They're strong enough to break the chain, though, when they want to. Yeah. Um... And what it, basically what keeps happening is it's a series of, it's it's like, it's like five or six diary entries Mm -hmm. or so, uh, written in broken English. Uh, yes. But it's obviously can write that mm-hmm. sort of relate what what its day to day like sort of life is. It tries to mm-hmm. it tries to listen to people upstairs. It gets beaten for daring to you know come up the stairs. It looks out a window at some point just to look at little children playing. Um, it gets punished for that. Uh, uh, so they they keep chaining chaining the child up to the wall. Yeah. And at one point it hides or they hide in the coal bin, but a creature shows up, which, as you said, was the. Well, the little, little the daughter, the little the girl shows up. Oh, right, right, right. She comes down the stairs because because some one of the kids sees sees the the other child in the basement and is like, what's that? Yeah. And so I assume the little girl or as the, the child refers to the kids, little fathers and mothers mm. um, goes down to investigate doesn't see anything but the cat little cat smells smells them and like goes to the bin and sees them and they like grab it Mm -hmm. and it bites them because it's a cat and that's what cats do and then they they kill it because it hurts Um, yeah they don't kill it because they're a monster they kill it because they kill it because they don't know what to do right they're very strong They they never interacted with a creature like this before yeah um and the little girl runs away in fear. Yeah, it says, I didn't want to hurt it. I got fear because it bit me harder than the rat does. Oh, yeah, because mm-hmm. also this poor child is bitten by rats. Yeah. I hurt and the little mother screamed. And I love that it refer- that the main character refers to children as little mothers and fathers because mm-hmm. they don't have any other frame of reference. Yeah. I grabbed the live thing tight. It made sounds I never heard. I pushed it all together. It was all lumpy and red on the black coal. Um, and then it hides, it, the child hides the dead animal under the pillow mm-hmm. because it, they're ashamed and scared. Yeah. Uh, I was afraid of the stick cause they get beaten by a stick whenever mm-hmm. they're bad or bad. Uh, um, yeah. I really have to applaud Richard Matheson's use of language. Mm-hmm. Like this is a, this, the language in this piece is phenomenal. Yeah. It says, the opening is, this day when it had light, mother called me a wretch. You wretch, she said. I saw in her eyes the anger. I wonder what is a wretch. This day Mm -hmm. it had water falling from upstairs. It fell all around. I saw that. The ground of the back I watched from the little window. The ground it sucked up the water like thirsty lips. It drank too much and it got sick and runny brown. I didn't like it. Like it does, the, the child doesn't even know what rain is mm-hmm. uh, or mud. It's it, it, they, uh, There's no frame of reference for the out of doors. So Richard Matheson is like, this is how this child would yeah. see everything. I, I don't know. It's, it's very really, well done. There's, um, uh, what's it called? It's, there's a, a style of writing that you do, um, where you take something familiar and you write it so that it's completely foreign to you. Yeah. Like you write it as if it was. Um, I learned how to do that in uh, my, in high school for my um, advanced like writing course that I took. Uh huh. Uh, Cause we were going to be writing a, um, a piece about a community that we were going to like, be going to and like studying and stuff and like writing about like, their behaviors and things i can't remember an ethnography Mm -hmm. um so we learned how to like deconstruct uh things that we're familiar with into words that like into ways that we aren't familiar with them yeah like doing the laundry and like things like that and it was a lot of fun and he does a really good job of it in this yes yes uh without overselling it yeah 
Yeah, this isn't Nell. This isn't I created my own language. This is just mm -hmm. I have limited vocabulary because of how little I'm talked to. Mm -hmm. So I'm constructing language based on that like kind of like how like when a when a uh like a an ape that has learned sign language has to put signs together in order to express thoughts that they haven't been taught the words to mm -hmm. um not to compare this child to an ape but that's the only thing no. i can think of <laughs> uh and i like i like the the writing in it as well because it's clear that this child is not unintelligent right no this is because yeah the, they they compare things to things in like pretty articulate and beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. um, and they're clearly smart. And I think that's really neat. Like it's not, they don't like dumb the, the child down. No, not at all. In fact, I don't think it would work. Yeah. If they, if the child was unintelligent. Yeah. Or even like portrayed as like having a mental disability in any way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think, I think that it it works best because it's it works best because otherwise I think it would seem like maybe he was making fun of the child mm -hmm. or trying to other it even more and yeah I don't know I don't know I mean obviously if the child had mental disabilities that'd be fine but mm -hmm. uh, uh, for a for a first time published writer he treaded some pretty dicey ground fairly elegantly. Yeah, um, and I think successfully. Yeah. So um, literally all that happens is uh, how you, you just sort of get an idea of who this child is. Um, what their life is like. What their life is like. <coughs> uh, when the child gets in trouble at one point, uh, they get beaten and says, Father tied my legs and arms up. He put me on my bed. Upstairs, I heard laughing while I was quiet there, looking on a black spider that was swinging down to me. I thought what Father said. Oh, God, he said, and only eight. Uh, yeah, everything is like seen through this filter of... Of... Uh, of... I don't know, this child's perception of the world. But what will this child grow into? Like, what is this child destined to become? Because it ends with the child rebelling and pulling the yeah. chain back out of the wall, knocking the stick out of the father's hand and, and vowing that they will be sorry if they're not nice to me. If they try to beat me again, I'll hurt them, I will. And like, that's just how it ends. Like, you have this thing where like, the child's now broken free. What's it going to do? We don't know. Like, it's a very short story. Yeah. And I, there's, there's like, I mean, it's obvious, I think, what the child's going to do. <laughs> uh, You're right. Because, I mean, that's how, how these things go. Eventually, if you get strong enough, right. and you fight back hard enough, it's just that thing where, like, it's very much a Frankenstein story. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where this, you know that. As like a reader, you know that no matter what happens, the the child is going to face rejection by everything mm -hmm. because the child isn't human and yeah. or doesn't look human. And you know that there is no good end to what could come. Right. This is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I also think that like Matheson is smart enough that like this is enough of the story. Oh, yeah. Like we didn't. We don't need any more. We don't need any more. Um, now we did get some more. <laughs> we did. There is a sequel to the story called "She Screech Like Me" by Michael mm -hmm. A. Arnzen, and it appeared in the collection "He Is Legend," which is a collection of short stories that are a tribute to Richard Matheson, mm -hmm. and it, and it includes sequels and prequels to a bunch of. Matheson's stories. Uh, yeah. So you have like stories based on Somewhere in Time. You have a prequel to I Am Legend. Um, you have variations on his stories, but you have She Screech Like Me, uh, which I haven't read, but which is apparently pretty good uh, mm -hmm. as a sequel to Born of Man and Woman. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try to seek this one out and see if I can uh, just figure out how it how it works as a sequel. Like what can you can possibly contribute. Uh, but Michael um, 
Michael Arnzen is a much published mm-hmm. horror writer. So I don't know. Maybe there's something there. <laughs> We should have sought it out before we did this episode and read it, and so we could do a longer episode. <laughs> well, I thought about it, but I was like, you know what? We don't need to. We don't need to get into too much yeah. into sequels. But this was adapted into a short film uh, in 1999, a six minute okay. long, a six okay. minute long movie. Yeah. I was like, if it's any longer than like five or ten minutes, no way. I, I just, I don't know. I haven't seen it because I can't find it. It's a six minute long short film that someone mm-hmm. made. I don't know if they made it as like a, a Clarice Phyllis, Phyllis, uh, who made four videos uh, in like 1999 and 2000. Like that's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, has appeared in a bunch of video productions, but not since like 2000. So uh, it's just a short film that was made. Six minutes. I don't know. What is the movie? Just the child walking upstairs? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was surprised, though, that this wasn't adapted into like a bunch of like you know, like uh, Twilight Zone episodes or episodes of mm-hmm. Tales from the Dark Side or something. I'm just surprised that it has never been readapted into into something because it seems like an interesting jumping off point. For exploring yeah. some of these themes. Like if you had a good writer and a good filmmaker, you could make a compelling 30 minute episode of of Cabinet of Curiosities about a family that keeps their child locked mm-hmm. up. Like I don't know, there's a lot of I think unlike the previous story, there's I think room for a lot of different explorations of yeah. of of this theme of I think this is a good Del Toro story. Right, right, because you get mm-hmm. like a great design, but you get the sympathetic monster. Yeah. Huh? We do love the and sympathetic you get, monster. You get, you get, you can get themes of fascism in there. You could have this. They could be fascist. You could set this during in fascist Spain. Well, no, I mean, just like the um, you don't have to be that heavy handed with it either. You can like the be, like the beating into submission if you don't do what you're told, and the sort of eruption of eventual rebellion can very very easily become symbolism of fascism right uh, the othering yeah oh yeah what's interesting mm-hmm. though is that uh is that in the intro to this story uh hartwell says um yada 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 born of man and woman is the contemporary monster story par excellence concise chilling psychologically disturbing the child is abused and is going to get even and the world in which such a child exists is not our own, but the world of fantastic horror. And I'm like, mm, I think the child, this is the world of our own. I think yeah. this is pretty much our world. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't know how to tell you this, man, but th- there's the, there's general historical, like a genuine historical evidence of, of kids being kept in, in rooms because they didn't look right. <laughs> right, right. Oh, disabled children uh, being mm. treated like monsters? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't uh, think we have to go too far. I think I can probably, like, go outside, open, like, some news, do a bit of research. Uh, last week, probably. Right, 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 right. I could probably just yell into the uh, into the, uh, into the the street, anybody mm-hmm. have an example of this recently happening? And they could just, like, point up the road, probably, too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's... it's this is our world, to the world yeah. we live in. Yeah, take that, always, David G. Hartwell. <laughs> it's always bizarre to me when people are like, this world cannot be our own. And I'm like, but, do you ha- but, but the writer yeah. is from this world. <laughs> right. and this is the world we live in. I yeah. hate to tell you, but almost all horror is the world we live in. That's um, what makes it horror. That's what makes it horror. That's why it's so terrifying. Uh, yep. Because it's because it's terrifying. Because so, we know, we know. Yeah. So get on that, uh, Gambo del Toro. It's got all of your themes in it. You love this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And this could be the episode that makes us cry. It, it could be. Because the last episode of the original series of season one mm-hmm. was the one about the ghost boy who had to be let go. Yeah. And made us cry. And uh did. And uh, yeah, did you know that Richard Matheson uh, appears as a char- as an actor in three, four movies, four, three? It doesn't surprise me. He is in Godfather Two as Senator Number Three. He is in Captains and Kings as President Garfield. 
the, the actual president Garfield, not <laughs> what if Garfield the cat became president? <laughs> That would be awesome. Played by Richard Matheson. And uh, Somewhere in Time as Astonished Man. I was just surprised that of the three, only one is a because he wrote the story. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, Godfather Part 2. I'm just like, was he like a script doctor on that? This is really interesting. Um, yeah, why was this never made into an amazing stories or anything? Why Why was it never adapted? I just, I don't understand. Just, it's ripe for the pickings. It really is. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Get on it. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it says here, you know what? I'm not even going to read this out loud to you because uh, I'm not, it's just, uh, there's a little blurb about the sequel that was written by Michael Arnson. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to read it out loud because it gives away too much. Um, too much. Too much. So uh, this child runs along the walls, has many legs, but we still love it. We love it like a, we love it like our own child. Um, good story. Good story. Upsetting. Ter- terrible parents. Terrible parents. Be good parents. Don't lock up your children. Uh, Question. Yes. What would you do if Mitzi had been born with many legs spewing green goo? First of all, I am tickled that you <laughs> didn't say what if I had been born. <laughs> I remember Mitzi's birth. I don't remember my birth. <laughs> um, If Mitzi had been born spewing green goo with many legs... Um, I mean, I probably would have, like, tried to get her some kind of help. Yeah. Like, I mean, I wouldn't just been like, we're going to take her home and raise her as a normal child. I would probably have been like, okay, something happened. Can we get some physical therapy? But clearly this child's intelligent. <laughs> clearly this child is aware that they are a child mm-hmm. and that these are their parents. So this isn't something where this child's going to be, like, a danger. Yeah. Like, this isn't a spitting cobra. This is a, still a child. It just has many legs. It drips green goo and it can walk on the walls. Give it a chance. You would have had a panic attack. You know what, though? At the time, I was kind of <laughs> having a low-grade panic attack all the time. So I don't even yeah. know if it would have pushed me over any kind of edge. That's fair. That's fair. So, you know. Would you have called me in the middle of the night or at like 10 p.m. to tell me that she was born, though? Yes. And I would have been like, get this. <laughs> And I would have been like, I'm hanging up the phone because I'm asleep while having this conversation. You would have been like, I'm hanging up the phone because I think I'm still asleep. I think I'm dreaming about my many-legged uh, new sister who drips green goo. Would you have been okay having a sister with many legs who dripped green goo? I think the goo would have been a bit much for me. Goo would have been a bit much. Uh, yeah. But apparently the child doesn't drip green goo all the time. So Yeah, so... If it if the, if she was just a kid with many legs, you know what? I probably would have been fine. Yep. I was a weird kid. Yep. We have celebrity in the state, not too far from the Twin Cities, two girls who share a body. Or mm-hmm. women, I guess. They're not girls anymore. Two women who share a body. Mm-hmm. They had their own reality show. They are teachers in the educational system. We're, we're like, cool, they're just members of the community. If they can be members of the community, I think we can make room for a child with many legs who drips green goo. It's just... He's also super strong. Yep, it's just a physical difference. Mm-hmm. People with disabilities and different body types, they're not the ones who need to change. The world needs to change around them. Mm-hmm. You probably have to get her into some therapy because... She'd have to learn her physical strength Mm -hmm. so she doesn't hurt anyone on accident. But I think it'd be fine. You heard it here first, folks. It's Del Toro time. We stand with the many-legged. We stand Mm -hmm. with the goo drippers. Get a membership to the Midwest Mountaineering. You're going to do great. Yeah. Uh, Get a job at Subway. Drip as much goo as you want. Nobody will know. Their sandwiches are gross. Exactly. Goo dripping. Many legs. You're still a member of this community. It's Del Toro we time. Need to get, we need to get merch that says, we stand the many-legged. We, we stand. stand the goo drippers. And we stand... I don't know what the third one could be. <laughs> I just, I don't know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to purchase a many-legged goo dripper shirt, let us know. I will design one and put it up for sale on Zazzle.com. <laughs> uh, I will make it available. I'll make a many-legged goo dripper shirt. But Willow... Mm-hmm. 
enough with the goo dripping. What is the next short story in it is. this series, which we're covering, called The Dark Descent uh, by David oh G. Boy. Hartwell? We're what? going back to Emily. Uh-oh, I'm going back to Emily, to Emily, to Emily. I'm going back to Emily. Uh-uh, I don't think so. Who wrote it? What is this story? Uh, My Dear Emily by Joanna Russ. Joanna Russ? Well, we a got woman. A, wo- a woman writer up in his joint. <laughs> I don't even know how to read this. Uh, not just a, a, a woman, but it looks like another novelette, maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, so- it's only 16 pages. It's longer than Born of Man and Woman. Well, okay, but everything in here is. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, join us next time. I've never read this story. Uh, I think I've read Joanna Russ, but we're excited because because it's a woman. Yep. <laughs> we're excited. Uh, uh, looking way, 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 way in the future. Uh, don't worry. We're going to be covering more women writers eventually, but we got to finish mm-hmm. this one first. We got to finish The Dark Descent first. And uh, then we, we have to finish our movies. <laughs> and we got to finish the movies, but don't worry. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> hey, I have like, from you, I think I have like six collections of stories by both queer writers, writers of color, and women writers. So we got some shiz to do. We got shiz to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, buy your Goo Drippin' shirts when I make them available. Buy your Pretty <laughs> Like It shirts. Uh, but otherwise, <laughs> listen to us. We're on, I post all these on YouTube, on my It's Phil uh, YouTube page. Uh, if you're in town, if you're in the Twin Cities in the beginning of August, Come see me and and Willow. We'll be at the Fringe Festival. I'll be performing Lost in Bear Country, my one-man show. Uh, So check that out if you are able uh, at the beginning of August, Minnesota Fringe Festival. Uh, Otherwise, everybody, I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. And we'll see you when it's Del Toro Toro time. time. I saw through my bio. I think this episode was as long as the previous one. I think you're probably right. Goodbye.